It's good to see everyone this morning, and those of you who are visiting with us, you are very welcome. If you don't have a Bible with you, there should be one in the front of the pew, uh, just in front of you there. And we're going to be spending a lot of our time in 1 Peter 1, which is on page 1075 of that particular Bible. We're going to make one stop in Ephesians first, but I'll have those passages up on the screen. I want to start this morning, This I did it again, didn't I? I already done that once in class today, this afternoon, by asking you a question. If you had a blank, just imagine that, that you're going to fill in, who would you put into this statement? Blank is the most gracious person I have ever met. Do you think about the person you would fill in that blank? Why is that? What about that particular person makes you consider them gracious? I suspect that we would have a lot in common there in what we choose. We would think of someone who is constantly doing for others. Someone who sees a need and without being told, fills that need. And that person would also be one who would expect nothing in return, maybe except one thing. Maybe the only thing that would be expected in return of that gracious action or gift given would be that it benefits the person in such a way that a positive change is made in the recipient's life. Who would that person be? Now let me ask you a harder question. <clears throat> Do you think anyone puts your name in that blank? That's tough, isn't it? That as we consider our actions, our attitudes toward others, would anyone consider us to be that person? And the reason that that's such an important question is that when we think about a gracious person, really what that person is, is somewhat of a microcosm of God. A God who is gracious in every way. A God who is giving. A God who is caring. A God who in His gifts is seeking to make the recipient better. In fact, grace is such an amazing term that we almost want to refrain from even using it in association with the human because it is such a godly quality. But that's the God we serve. And the God we serve wants us to be a people who are gracious. And what we're going to see in our lesson today is that that idea of grace is going to be very important throughout our lives, but in particular two times that are designated, we want to look at. And between those two times, what we're going to see is that God is saying to us, my expectation for the recipient of my grace is for you to be the kind of person who can be holy as I am. So let's start out with that concept that we just sung about. An amazing grace that saves us. And what I'd like to do is to look at this from some passages in Ephesians chapter 2. And as the apostle starts these thoughts, he says, let me explain to you the problem of sin. And so he starts out by a statement concerning us when we're without God. He says, you do realize, don't you, that you were dead in the trespasses and sins? That's been the point since Genesis 3. That whenever sin and humanity come together, death is the result of that. And so Paul here is not talking about physically dying to these people, but he says when you think about your relationship with God, when you think about your spiritual state, when you think about your eternal state, you're, you're just dead. And that would be a very depressing thought if that's where he stopped, but he uses that very dark picture to paint a very bright picture when he says, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. 
Here is a God whose richness is described not in terms of wealth as we would consider it, but in the thing that we need most, and that being mercy. And the picture Paul's presenting here is a God who is so generous that He's lavishly giving out this mercy to any who see themselves in this condition and want to be out of it. And as the apostle is apt to do, he stops his thought with an interjection, and he says here, by grace you have have been saved. That is one of the most beautiful statements ever written. Because what that statement is saying is, is that though we were dead, there is hope for us. That hope from a Father who is so merciful that He lavishes us with His mercy. But Paul wants to make sure we get a point. And so after saying that we are saved by grace, he continues on and he says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no man may boast. Here the apostle says, to be a recipient of this grace, it's going to travel through your faith. It's going to come through your faith. But he says, let's make sure we get something straight because the apostle knew how humans think. For sure the Holy Spirit knew that. And he said, don't you ever think that this grace is somehow something you have accomplished. Some great deed that you have done. Something special about you. He says, no. He says that you're saved by God, not by yourself. And so with that amazing backdrop, we're going to come to 1 Peter chapter 1, where Peter is going to say about this grace, that when you consider that idea of a God who is so gracious, the way you can see that grace is in the personification and manifestation of Jesus Christ. That when you think about Jesus, what you're thinking about is the grace of God. And we're not going to take time this morning to look at all of this, but if you look at the introduction of the letter here in verses 3 down through verse 12, it's just a piling on of all of these ideas of salvation and how God has brought this mercy and how God has brought this grace and how God has brought us to the knowledge of what saved. And so the, the letter begins in this robust, demonstration of this is what grace in Jesus Christ looks like. Where I want us to pick up in the text, though, is in verse 13. So we take all of this combined. We think about what the apostle has said in Ephesians chapter 2. We think about how Peter has introduced his letter in this way. If you were here last Sunday, you can think back to how we talked about our consecration beginning in the waters of baptism when we're baptized into the blood of Jesus Christ. So we take this whole picture of where we are when we are saved. And that's where Peter starts when he says, let me give you another aspect. So we've looked at this initial grace that brings us to salvation. And now Peter says, let's talk about grace that's going to come at a different time. And I want to read verse 13, leaving out the two things that Peter is going to say specifically to us as far as preparation for this. And so he says, verse 13, leaving those two things out, Therefore, based on all this we've just read about in the introduction, Therefore, Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So here, we've talked about the grace that brings us to salvation. The grace that's shown when we're baptized into Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins. The grace that saves. And yet Peter says, I want you to think about a different angle of grace. I want you to rest your hope, set it fully on that grace that's going to be revealed when Jesus returns. It's no surprise to us that the word revelation here is the same word as apocalypse. You think about the book of Revelation, that's what that word means. And it's nothing in this point that's to bring to our minds as we tend to think about some apocalyptic event that's disastrous. In fact, it's just the opposite. 
The term apocalypse or revelation just simply means you're going to be able to see the full picture. That happens to us, doesn't it? Maybe we get a little piece of information and then we have the whole thing explained to us. That's an apocalypse. We see it all. And so what Peter is saying here is, you can trust Jesus. You know who He is. He's the God who saves you. But yet you've never seen Him in His fullness. In fact, that's what John's going to tell us. He says, but one day that's going to change. That when Jesus returns, you're going to see the entire picture of who He is. And it's on that hope that you need to rest your, that on that grace, you need to rest your hope. I want to go back to Paul for just a minute here, back in Ephesians 2, and fill in a little detail I left out earlier. In verses 6 and 7, as the apostle is also explaining this, the apostle Paul, he says, And he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Let's stop there for a minute. This is right here and now for those of us who are Christians. This is not a future event. The apostle says he has seated. He's done this. He's seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And this is kind of one of those already but not yet moments where we look at this and we understand that our salvation is so secure that we are seated right here and now with Jesus, though it doesn't appear that way from from, uh, just looking at the natural world around us. But he says you can trust that. But he goes on. And he says, "...so that in the coming ages..." He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Two things. Every generation, as long as the world keeps spinning, is going to have the opportunity to know the riches of grace in Christ Jesus. That salvation is going nowhere. But the apostle again perhaps is giving us a bit of a glimpse into the future also. As the Apostle Peter does, the Apostle Paul says, so that in that coming time, you're going to be able to see the kindness of Jesus Christ, the fullness of that, of who He is and what He's done for you. And So here we have Peter, we have Paul, who are showing us two things, that grace is known in coming to Jesus. That when I am baptized, I can receive that grace. But both are also saying that while grace is known in coming to Jesus, grace is going to be fully known when Jesus comes to us, when He returns and He carries His faithful back home with Him. That's where we're going to see the grace of God on which our current hope can have its rest. So, With all that in mind then, what is Peter going to tell us that we need to do? Well, let's go back to verse 13 and fill in those two things. When he says, therefore, he says, first thing, you need to gird up the loins of your mind. Now, if you're reading from an era translation, it's not going to have that phrase. It's been changed to preparing your minds for action. I understand the reasoning behind that. I imagine most modern readers, if they read, therefore gird up the loins of your mind, would have no idea what that meant. And so what these translators have done is given a rather literal meaning. And that's a rich phrase, isn't it? And when you understand the first century picture of this, that this is someone who's got a mission that's so important, you're just going to wrap that that robe around your legs where it's not going to trip you up, and you're going to take off. That's what the apostle is trying to tell us. He's saying you are making everything in your life ready for this grace that's going to be revealed at the apocalypse of Jesus Christ. And so with your mind prepared, there is nothing that you're going to allow to get in your way. That's how important this is, that you want to see that so badly, that your hope is so resting on that, that nothing is going to get in your way. And then he goes on and he says, also, you need to be sober-minded. 
Sober is a word that we most of the times think about as the opposite of being drunk, which is for sure what it is. Why do people become intoxicated? What's the motivation behind that? Whether it be alcohol, drug use, whatever. Usually it's two different things. Most of the time it's trying to forget something. Now, there's your life is not going in the direction you want it to, and you're trying to forget it. The other time, maybe you're trying to experience a higher level than you think you're on now. And so you take these narcotics, or you drink the alcohol, or whatever, that you hope is going to kind of open up this new view of things. Either way, what they're doing is distorting present reality, which is never a good thing. And yet we think about that term drunk in lots of ways, not just with liquor, with drugs. We think about being drunk with love, somebody who is so infatuated. Or we think about being drunk with power, somebody who's always wanting to be in charge. There's lots of things that distort that reality. And so the Apostle Peter says, you need to be sober-minded, allowing nothing to take your mind off of what you're looking toward when God calls all this to a close and Jesus comes back for us. So therefore, he says... Gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober-minded. Be ready, prepared for action so that you are not sidetracked by any kind of false hope. Now with that said, I think it would be a foolish person who would say, I never have problems with that. That I'm never challenged with having that kind of mindset. I think for most of us, we realize how easy it can be to get off track. And so sometimes when life is not going the way we want it to, we take that as, as maybe God's rebuke of us. Of God saying, well, I'm letting this happen to you because you're not doing what you need to do. Or maybe if it's not that, you think God's let you down. That here you are, you're this faithful person, and yet A, B, and C have happened to you, and life hasn't turned out your way, and it's, it's just not what you want it to be. I have run into so many people who have that concept. And yet, what does Peter say? Peter says, what you got to do is make sure that you're staying focused on what is true reality here, and not allowing that to make you look in a direction you should not look. And thus, a mindset of this nature is constantly looking forward. That really, regardless of what kind of things are happening in the here and now, we're saying there is nothing that can stop me from being faithful to that hope of seeking the grace of Jesus upon His return. That's the kind of mindset we're to have. Now, let's continue with the apostle here. When he says, okay, you got it founded on this grace. Your salvation came from the grace of God when you were baptized. That's where it started. But as Peter tells us, it's now reaching for the promise to come. Stretching out for it. You remember the last time you really looked forward to something? Likely you were doing everything within your power to make sure that nothing got in the way. You had the car filled up so you wouldn't run out of gas. <laughs> had the kids taken care of so you didn't have to stop at the last minute. Whatever. That's what Peter's saying. He's saying you're always reaching for that promised grace to come. So how do we get there? Well, he doesn't leave us in the dark. As we look to verse 14... He's going to start out by saying, okay, now if you're a part of this people who are awaiting the revelation of Jesus Christ, you're anxiously anticipating it with hope, he says what you've got to be then is obedient children. And so that's how he starts out verse 14. People who are waiting for the revelation of Jesus are obedient children. And he describes that in a not this but this way. He says, as obedient children, not conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. You're not returning to your pre-grace lifestyle. He says the obedient child, the faithful one, looking for the revelation of Jesus Christ isn't looking in the rearview mirror. 
isn't thinking about all the things I've had to give up, all the things I'd like to do if it wasn't for being a child of God. He says, none of that. By the way, his word conformed there, same word as Romans 12, where the apostle says, do not be conformed to this world. He says, none of that. But instead, and this is the passage we're kind of focusing on this year, instead, as He who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Saved by grace, resting our hope on the grace that will be revealed at the coming of Jesus. And what's happening between those two times of grace when our life is given to God, when we're brought from death into life to Him, and at that time, when either we rise from the grave or if we're still alive, we rise to meet Him in the air and we meet Him for that new life in between. The apostle says, Be holy in all your conduct. In fact, he says, Be holy as God Himself is holy. And so if I'm a Christian with my hope resting on what's to come, that's where I need to be. So what does that life look like? Again, we're going to let the Apostle Paul help us out here. As he writes to Titus, he says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. We've been saved. How do we need to live? Here's how. Renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. Live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in the present age, waiting for that blessed hope the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for Himself a people for His own possession who are zealous for good works. Paul says what you need to be doing now in being holy as God is holy is A, keep yourself away from sin. Don't go back to your pre-grace lifestyle. Renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. And choose the zealous produce, the zealous pursuit, rather, of being righteous. And so you put these two ideas together, and what we're finding is the picture of what being holy looks like. So then, as we consider where we are, <clears throat> people who are saved by the grace of God, people whose hope is resting on the grace to be revealed at the revelation of Jesus Christ, people who are seeking to be holy as God is holy, I want to warn us about three things. As we consider these ideas, one of the things that we need to be very careful of is believing that grace does not mean anything about righteous living. That if we believe grace is saving us, that, that holy living really is just a side thing. It's not important. That particular idea permeates Protestant religion. And it's dangerous. In fact, it's so dangerous. We have a passage in the New Testament that helps us with this. And I've, I've gone to the King James because I think it captures the idea the best. Paul's writing, and he's, he's again on this idea of we're dead to sin. He says that sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. The very idea that someone could take the precious grace of God and say, you know what, we would see God's grace a whole lot more if we just kept on sinning because we could sin and God could forgive and we could sin and God could forgive and His grace would just shine. And Paul says, God forbid a thought like that. And he adds, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer in it? And so the warning that the apostle says here is that those who are saved by grace must never look at sin as a good option. 
And the particular danger that we find here is in falling prey to what's been entitled cheap grace. In the 1930s, it's a rough time in Germany for sure, as we know what was happening there. There was a German theologian by the name of Diedrich Bonhoeffer. He's got a very interesting story in his dealings with the political things of the day, but he was a man who focused a great deal on spiritual matters. In 1937, he wrote a book called The Cost of Discipleship. I don't know if he coined the term cheap grace, but here's where we find it coming into print. And this is what Bonhoeffer had to say. He said, cheap grace is defined as preaching forgiveness without requiring repentance. Baptism without church discipline. Communion without confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ. One of the most permeating false doctrines that we have faced in the last couple of hundred years has been the concept of once you're saved, you're always saved. That there's nothing you could possibly do that could remove your soul from the hand of God. And what that has produced is an abundance of cheap grace. That you have a a religious world that many people believe holds no real motivation for doing right. Because as long as you're saved, there is nothing you can do to undo that. I believe that's what Bonhoeffer is referring to. When he says this is a grace that really is not built on anything. That's danger number one. Danger number two, let's go to the other end of the spectrum. And that's the concept that holy conduct is all I need for salvation. This is where we have to be awfully careful. Because holy conduct is of absolute necessity for our salvation. You think about in Matthew chapter 25 where Jesus says, I was hungry and you did not feed me. I was thirsty, you did not give me a drink. I was naked, you did not clothe me. I was in prison, you did not visit me. And those on the left say, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or naked or in prison? And he says, when you didn't do it to the least of these, my brethren, you didn't do it to me. And he says, depart from me into outer darkness. Yes, holy conduct is of absolute necessity. Here's the danger. It's when we begin to believe that my good conduct negates my need for grace. That I can be good enough where God is going to save me because of that. I don't know that anybody says that out loud. But it's an easy trap to fall into. This would be a group of people who are a little uncomfortable talking about grace. They don't particularly like the idea that that everybody's in need of it, though that might come out in word, it's not felt from the heart. And so the danger here is being like the older brother in the parable of the two brothers and the father. We oftentimes focus on the one we call the prodigal, but the older brother is ever bit as much a main character as the younger brother. And you'll recall after the younger brother comes home and there's the great celebration, everything's going on. He very disrespectfully says to his father, starting with the word, look. (laughs) We already know this is not going in a good direction. Look, these many years I have served you and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. I want us to realize something about this parable. The younger son did not deserve half of his father's livelihood, and neither did the older brother. Neither of them had earned it. Neither of them had worked all the years that the father had worked. But yet you hear this self-entitlement, arrogant statement of the 
older brother, I have done nothing wrong, therefore I deserve what you have never given to me. That's the attitude that we're talking about. Because this is the attitude that sees no need of grace for oneself and believes sinners are unentitled to that grace. We best pay attention to the kinds of things we say. When we start talking about those people, those people who believe that, those people who believe this, and it is totally a conversation without the hope that the grace of God can find them, we are in danger of being like this. And so while on the one end of things it's wrong to believe that grace totally negates holy conduct, it is just as wrong to believe that holy conduct negates the need for grace. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Let me give you one third warning, and maybe this is 2B rather than 3, because it fits in very much with this idea, but from a different angle. It's believing... <clears throat> then I have little hope of being saved. And I suspect of all three of these dangers, it's number three that I have been most associated with, both not only in myself, but those around me. It's looking at all of these majestic passages that we've read this morning, this afternoon, and we've said... I have a total lack of confidence that God can save me. Are we going to say it like that? We are not. In fact, how we're going to say it is something like this. I'm always falling short. I never do enough for God. I need to be busier in the service of God. I need to be doing more. And maybe four or five times a day, we have the feeling that I've lost my salvation. And what if I don't pray about it right now? Does that sound like hope to you? That our hope is fully resting on the revealing of Jesus Christ, not in the least. In fact, it's the total opposite of Peter's assurance because the concept is the revelation of Jesus Christ scares me to death. Because if Jesus came right now, I don't think I'm ready. I don't think I've done enough. I don't think I'm good enough. Without realizing that the fact that you're not good enough is the exact reason the grace of God has appeared to all men bringing salvation. So then, with those dangers in mind, what are we going to say about saved people awaiting the revelation of Jesus Christ? What we better say is, is that our hope is grounded in the steadfast love of God. That's what the psalmist believed when he said his delight, talking about God, is not in the strength of a horse nor his pleasure in the legs of a man, but the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear Him, in those who hope in His steadfast love. The good thing about the steady love of God is, is you always know who He is and what He wants because He doesn't change. He doesn't go out on a whim. He's not carried away by motion to change his mind about something that he's promised us. And that's where my hope needs to be. I also need to understand that in being in that relationship with God, I am set apart. I am a part of a holy people who's been consecrated into the family of God. And I need to conform to His holiness. Far from believing that my conduct is going to save me, what I understand is, is that my conduct is the action of a transformed heart. I don't believe I'm laying up some kind of celestial bank account where if I can just cross a certain line, my salvation's secure. What I believe is I'm saved by the grace of God and with every fiber of my being, I'm trying to be like Him. And thus my conduct is going to be like God, holy as He is holy. 
So my conduct is this outward action along with the trust that when I mess up, God's willing to forgive. There may very well, there will be times when I need to go to God and ask His forgiveness. But I trust that He's there and forgives. And I trust that if I'm getting off track, God is going to chasten me as a father does a son. I trust in Him. And I need to be looking forward to that revelation. That I'm anticipating the revelation of Jesus Christ with excitement. I don't want for one minute to indicate that death is not a frightening thing. It is, because it's unnatural to people created in the image of God. We're not supposed to die. But what God has said is, while getting from this life to the next may be a frightening thing, you can be fully confident that in the grand scheme of things, you're okay. In fact, you're better than okay. You're saved by the grace that came through the blood of Jesus Christ. That's how much God desires to save us. And that's what I need to be as a person saved by grace, seeking to be holy as God is holy, resting my hope on the grace to come at the revelation of Jesus. I need to long for that day when I can look upon Him in His fullness and to understand that everything that I've been through has been for a purpose. And that the taste I have gotten of the grace of Jesus Christ while I'm here, I can now fully explore eternally in finding the riches of His fullness in that grace He's promised. And so I encourage us all to have that hope. If you are a Christian and you fall into that category, you're just terrified of the coming of the Lord, I feel your pain. But I hope that all of us can come to that confidence that God has said we can have. To trust that He's going to get us through this life. To those who are not Christians, I want you to have this hope. But more than that, God wants you to have this hope. God has explained in so many places, in so many ways, in so many details, how much love He's had for us that He would do all of this so that we could be saved. But the one thing He's not going to do is force us into it. But if you're ready to be saved by the grace of God, you don't need to delay that. You need to be consecrated coming to the waters of baptism, having your sins washed away, coming into contact with the blood of Jesus Christ so that you can die to sin and live to Him. Let's be ready. And should the Lord return today, I hope everyone in the room can join in. Come, Lord Jesus. You need to respond to His invitation. Won't you come now as we stand and sing together?